Okay, so here we go in five, four, three, two, one. Welcome to Radio Flash, Armada's dedicated defense and security electromagnetic podcast with your host, Tom Withington, at the controls. The importance of space as a domain of warfare is increasing at breakneck speed. Since Sputnik first zoomed into the cosmos in October 1957, militaries have coveted space as an environment through which to fly missiles, perform espionage and communicate. The end of the Cold War in the late 1980s did little to diminish this appetite. The rise of China and Russia's aggressive posture has only served to make space ever more strategically important. Deepening global military interest in space is having a corresponding effect on the electromagnetic environment as actors seek to preserve access to their space-based assets while denying this to their rivals. To help us make sense of these challenges, I'm joined today by Juliana Zeus, Research Fellow on Space Security at the Royal United Services Institute, and she joins us today from London. Juliana, it's great to have you with us. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Tom. Thanks for having me. So let's start by talking a little bit about electromagnetic attacks on space capabilities and the relevance of these attacks to the wider issue of counter space measures and weapons. That's a great question, Tom. I mean, as you already said in your introduction, you know, Sputnik in 1957, the sort of utility of space was recognized quite early on. So actually the first counter space weapon um, that was tested was actually in 1959. So, you know, not even two years after the first satellite was in orbit um, was a sort of thought around counter space capabilities. So, you know, trying to look into the, the context of wider counter space weapons and measures, I think there's sort of four basic types um, that we sort of distinguish. There's kinetic, by which we mean direct ascent anti-satellite weapons, um, the likes of which, you know, China, India, the US and Russia recently have tested. There's co-orbital weapons, so sort of kinetic weapons that are already placed in space and that can sort of attack other satellites and ground station attacks. Because I think we sometimes forget that, you know, space is not just a satellite in orbit. There's also other systems on Earth that, that support those. There's also non-kinetic weapons that includes a nuclear weapon, for example, or directed energy. There's also cyber, which again, I think goes unnoticed a lot of the time because people sort of underestimate the sort of motivation that there might be to hacking a satellite. Um, So, you know, a ground station could be hacked, the satellite itself could be hacked. Um, There's lots of uh, sort of threat vectors here. And lastly, electronic weapons, um, which is obviously the purpose of us chatting today. Um, And by that, we mean jamming and spoofing. To sort of discuss what's the sort of difference between jamming and spoofing for anyone who may not be sort of familiar with that, jamming is the sort of interruption of the signal, the replacement of the signal, um, meaning that sort of whatever signal wants to be received, the receiver can no longer uh, sort of receive because it's unclear, you know, it gets sort of drowned out by the jammer itself. Spoofing uh, is a little bit more malicious in that sense because it can be quite hard to detect because spoofing is a replacement of that signal with disinformation. And so that can be a lot harder to detect. In terms of what points are vulnerable, all of the above, basically. Um, so I mentioned earlier, you know, space systems are not just satellites. We've got a ground station, we've got the satellite, and we've got the links in between. Um, so, which is also why we distinguish between uplink jamming and downlink jamming. So when we talk about uplink jamming, uh, it's a signal that's going to the satellite that is being disrupted. And if we're talking about downlink jamming, uh, it's a signal that's coming back down to the ground and that is being disrupted. I think in terms of differences to other weapons and why sort of electronic weapons uh, might be used and perhaps also why we don't really hear about them. You know, we, we saw, you know, all over the media and the sort of rumors that uh, Russia might be deploying or might be developing a nuclear weapon in space uh, earlier in 2024. That made the news, that made headlines. The direct descent anti-satellite weapon uh, that Russia launched into space and also hit a satellite with one of its own defunct satellites in 2021, that made the headlines. Why don't we talk about electronic measures as much? Well, number one, they're temporary. Jamming and spoofing are sort of almost everyday aspects of modern day warfare. 
they're also reversible. So as soon as the jammer is sort of turned off, as long as soon as the spoofing sort of stops, um, that means the sort of receivers aren't uh, sort of affected for the long term. You also don't need to be a space power to sort of carry out such an attack. Um, for example, I'm sure we'll talk later in the in the debate about uh, sort of Iran or North Korea, who are you know both known to be capable um, of jamming at least. And the last point is attribution. Um, there's certain counter space weapons where it's very clear who carried out what attack. Direct ascent uh, anti-satellite weapons are a big example of this, right? You can always tell sort of where that missile was started from. Jamming and spoofing, it can get a little bit more tricky. And the sort of ways to do this, you know, triangulation, trying to figure out where the, where the uh, jamming signal came from, for example. Um, but specifically, if it's a sort of crowded area in terms of actors, um, it can get a lot more tricky to actually be able to say who carried out uh, what jamming or spoofing attack. So have you seen any recent examples of space EW? I was interested with many of the points you made just now, and you mentioned, for instance, Iran, uh, uh, DPRK, Democratic People's Republic of Korea, is uh, an alleged offender in this sphere. Russia and Ukraine, for instance, have you seen any examples there or, or perhaps places further afield as well? If we're looking at the conflict in Ukraine right now, there wasn't as much electronic warfare as had been initially assumed that would take place. Um, because obviously the Russians, as we know, their doctrine places a lot of uh, sort of focus, a lot of emphasis on information dominance, information warfare, um, sort of the big sort of focus on those areas, which would make us assume that electronic warfare would play a pretty big role. And it didn't quite to the extent that we thought it would. There's a couple of reasons for this, and my colleagues have written to this at a great extent. Their conclusion was that it's sort of a mixture of inefficient positioning on the Russian part, um, but also the fear of Ukrainian counterattacks. Now, that doesn't mean there haven't been anything, and there's definitely been a sort of increase over the course of the war. Um, according to Hawkeye 360, um, they definitely noticed GPS interference in and around Ukraine increasing uh, before the full-scale invasion. But also we have seen uh, jamming of Ukrainian SATCOM and GPS since 2014 in eastern Ukraine. Um, and in all likelihood, that was using Russian systems. In the context of capabilities, sort of, you know, what specifically can the Russians do? What do we know? What kind of capabilities they have? Um, we know they're able to jam SATCOM user terminals within range. We also know they can jam GPS user terminals within range. We have a lot of knowledge actually on uh, Russian electronic warfare capabilities precisely for the fact that they have been using them. You know, if we're looking at, for example, China, which is a huge space actor right now, we know, you know, about some of their counter space capabilities, but we actually don't know that much about their EW capabilities precisely because they haven't deployed them in a war. Going back to Ukraine, there's definitely been reports um, that jamming has affected weapon systems that use GPS, such as Excalibur, HIMARS, JDAM, we've seen those. Um, but actually, interestingly, if we're looking at sort of what's been what's been used on the Ukrainian side, we've seen very limited attempts at jamming Starlink, for example. To briefly explain Starlink, um, for anyone who has missed it, Starlink is a, a, a satellite constellation in lower Earth orbit that provides internet, basically. That's all that it really does. Um, but it's a huge constellation, and it's obviously beaming down signals that interact with the ground station in return uh, with the user terminals. Um, so we have, we know at least... You know, Elon Musk tweeted about this early on in the war, saying that there had been attempts to jam and cyber attack Starlink. And there has been some evidence now that Russia is actually using Starlink themselves. And so I think it's to, for that reason alone, it's sort of unlikely that attacks will persist specifically where it's also being used um, on the Russian side. We've also generally seen an increase uh, in jamming and spoofing of GPS starting from late 2023 onwards. You know, Finland, Sweden, Poland... Uh, Latvia, we've obviously seen the Estonian airport that had to pause some flights as a result, um, where we've seen some sort of circle spoofing, um, where it makes it look like a plane, for example, is circling a certain location, even if it isn't. And that's not particularly new either. We've definitely seen sort of other instances uh, where GPS spoofing or jamming is used outside of a conflict. For example, uh, civil GPS was jammed in Norway and Finland at the same time as a NATO exercise back in 2018. Um, there was an airport in Tel Aviv in 2019 that experienced GPS disruption. Actually, the UK Royal Air Force uh, reported jamming uh, for its military flights out of Cyprus in March 2021. And that was also the same year uh, that a US Navy warship uh, was sort of 
made to look like it was sailing with the Ukrainian fleet um, when it was actually in port in Odessa. So there's definitely, definitely been uh, other instances of spoofing outside of conflicts. The Russians are particularly known for this. We know that they use uh, jamming and specifically uh, global navigation services spoofing um, sort of for VIP protection. Um, even though since that has been known, there's been sort of less of that. Um, so has been decreasing. Perhaps other methods are being used now. And then there's another example um, of the U.S. drone that was landed in Iran uh, a couple of years ago. We don't exactly know what happened there. There's not too much out there in terms of open source uh, reporting. So the exact circumstances are unclear. Um, but it looks like it was likely a result of some kind of jamming and spoofing, perhaps a combination of both. What do you think are the relevant lessons for the international community Re regarding this, I must say, very impressive list of examples that you, you just read out, a lot of them which were news to me as well. I suppose first you need to be learning from this and what should we be doing about it, if we can do anything about it, of course. I think number one is to be ready for disruption or degradation of services. Obviously, militaries everywhere are incredibly reliant on space capabilities, you know, whether that's satellite communications, whether that's GPS. The vast majority of military operations couldn't be sustained as they are currently uh, without space capabilities to some extent. And I think Specifically, you know, for example, we're looking at, I'm, I'm sitting here in London, specifically looking at the UK perspective, um, the experience that the British military has had, you know, for looking at Iraq or Afghanistan, GPS disruption wasn't as prominent as it, as it might be in a future conflict. You know, I think there were some GPS jams that were found in Iraq, but they were actually not particularly useful in actually jamming GPS. So, you know, this is something that still sort of has to be reckoned with. And I think it's quite important that we train for those disruptions, for those degradations, and that we potentially also have systems in place, that we can definitely have systems in place that can actually uh, sort of mitigate this, that we have, for example, terrestrial alternatives. Um, because another thing that we quite often forget and take space for granted is it doesn't need to be a sort of adversarial action that prevents us from using space. It could be a solar flare. Right. It could it could be it could be space weather and that could sort of knock out satellite services for a prolonged period of time. And specifically, if we're looking towards GPS or general navigation and timing services, a lot of the economy is tied up in these services. Um, and there have been some calculations done to sort of look into the economic impact um, if those services were to fail. Uh, and it's in the sort of mark of around a billion a day. So, you know, this is this is a lot of money um, tied up here as well. You know, not to even speak of the sort of human costs as well, obviously, with emergency services um, being, being tied to these as well. So be ready for disruption, train for the sort of eventuality of it failing, uh, but also use resilience systems. And I think this is where, you know, partnerships come in handy as well. GPS is not the only navigation system. And I have kind of used uh, sort of GPS um, or, you know, GPS and navigation are sometimes talked about sort of interchangeably. Obviously, GPS is the American system. Um, there's a civil and a military signal um, that we also need to distinguish between reason why the civil, the civil signal is quite easy to disrupt is actually because by the time the signal comes down to Earth from the satellite, it's actually quite weak. Uh, the military signal works a little bit differently, but we need to be ready for those alternatives. Um, obviously, there's Galileo, uh, which, is the, which is the EU um, constellation that uses navigation. The Russians use GLONASS and the Chinese use Beidou. Um, so I think, you know, having partnerships in place, specifically looking into, uh, you know, what can be done with Galileo, but also in terms of what can we do with alternatives? Where can we share knowledge? Uh, space definitely has a sort of problem when it comes to classification. A lot of the systems are sort of classified sometimes unnecessarily or to an unnecessary uh, sort of extent. There's actually something in the US at the moment uh, where Congress has asked a US Space Force to declassify or you know, lower the classification levels of some of its projects because it's actually hindering sort of inter-services conversations um, that can't be shared because its system is too highly classified. Um, they're currently late in reporting back with the progress, um, but we'll see. We'll see what happens with that. So in a nutshell, in a very roundabout way, um, you know, readiness, training, terrestrial alternatives and find partners. Juliana, before we finish, um, talk us through some of the cool things that you're working on at the moment. You know, obviously, people are listening to this podcast, but if you now want to you know, hear more about uh, space on a podcast, uh, please listen to uh, War in Space, which is a podcast uh, that I host. 
we're now going on to nearly 40 episodes. Um, so there's lots of stuff to catch up on. Uh, you know, we talk more about counter space weapons and measures. Uh, we also talk about constellations like Starlink. We talk about uh, constellations like OneWeb and also Skynet. Uh, so lots of stuff uh, there as well. I've also written an article on how Russia and Ukraine respectively have been using uh, space systems over the course of the war and how counter space might have also played a role. It's currently only out in German. Uh, so if you if you can read uh, German, feel free to uh, read it uh, from the Serious Journal. Otherwise, I'm working on a translation and getting that out as soon as I can. I must say, 40 episodes, that definitely puts Radio Flash to shame. We clearly have some catching up to do. I would heartily endorse your podcast. I've, I've listened to it on a good few occasions and really enjoyed it. Um, so I'd obviously encourage all of our readers to uh, go and consult that and download it, have a listen to it, um, learn more about space in general, militarization of space in general. Juliana, it's been great. Listen, thanks very much for joining us. And uh, if you'd like to learn more about Juliana's work, uh, along with her podcast, uh, please do visit Rusi's website at rusi.org. Don't forget there's more defense and security news and analysis at armadainternational.com. That's all we've got time for. Thanks for listening.